Hey, hello. How are you? This is a show for everyone else. Instead of going after top 1% of the world, we dedicate this podcast to celebrate the lives of the unsung heroes and self-made artists. Hi there, this is Fei Wu, and you're listening to the Face World podcast. Today on the show, welcome David Burkus, who is a best-selling author, and his new book, Friend of a Friend, offers new perspectives and tactics that will work for you today on how to better network and build key connections. You know, you're, I was so excited about your book because I think, honestly. It is the core of my my own existence, and it's a very much of a reflection. And the purpose now has become ever more clear to me when it comes to podcasting. I've only been doing it for three and a half years, but the the amount of connections I've built, the opportunities that basically presented themselves, are precisely what you're just talking about. Uh, it, it's really fascinating. Another. Area, I can't believe it took me this long to do this because whenever you meet a martial artist, you feel like <laughs> that it could consume the entire recording of the podcast. I uh, very quickly realized that you're a Brazilian jiu jitsu practitioner, yeah. competitor. Uh, or do you still compete, by the way? Uh, I have not. So, in I, have not, I haven't competed in about a year and a half. In December of 20. 16, I think I broke my foot, but I was doing a hip throw on somebody and rolled my ankle in such a way that I broke my outside metatarsal. It's actually called a Jones fracture. It happens a lot in basketball, but it happened because I was trying to lift up somebody I really shouldn't have been trying to lift up and throw down. Um, and so that happened, I think, in December of 2016. And I haven't competed since then. Um, but we're still, I'm still practicing it regularly, still there three or four times a week. I, I say that, uh, one, it's exciting. Uh, and two, I noticed there are traces of martial arts philosophy and thinking in your writing. Uh, but I also think there are a lot of parallels between martial arts and particularly this book, uh, Friend of a Friend, and the networking impact that to me with social media, with mobile phones and everybody looking down, I feel like Martial arts is potentially the most intimate exercises. And, you know, and also there's a lot of teamwork involved, like how we work with one another, how we prepare ourselves before a fight, how not just the meditation part, but learning about e each other's quirks and, and behaviors. And it's really fascinating. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, fundamentally, it's, it's one of those areas. And, and I would lump, uh, for, this, for the sake of argument, I would lump wrestling and a couple other sort of derivatives of fighting sports in with this. But it's, it's, it's in general, it's, it's the only individual sport that also feels like a team sport. You're competing individually, but you're not alone when you're in the ring, right? There's this whole group of people that you're training with and sweating with every day. There's a group of people that, I mean, your goal is to defeat them at the same time you understand the mutual benefit and, and well-being. And, and, you know, in, in Friend of a Friend, actually, we talk about um, one of the most potent things, like one of the big messages in the book is you have permission to skip every networking event ever from here on out, as long as you're investing in what the sociologist Brian Uzi calls shared activities, things where there is that draws a diverse group of people to do something other than connecting. That thing is high stakes, meaning there is you can win or lose. And it, and it requires you to sort of coordinate as a team. And almost every practice works that way. You can't really practice a move. I mean, there are, you can do like, you can work pads and that sort of thing. Although even then you know, you need someone to hold the pads for you, but almost every, eventually you're going to have to spar. You're going to have to roll as we say in jujitsu, and that requires another person. And that requires a, a level of trust, but also a level of coordination and sort of intimacy with them that you build a relationship with them faster and deeper than you would if that same person was sitting across from you at some, you know, networking mixer. Right, because you've got all of these things in play. And it draws a diverse group of people. I mean, I've met some of the most interesting people. Like this is a weird... You don't normally meet that diverse group of people at the country club or at the, the cocktail party or the dinner party or anything like that. You, you kind of only meet them in an activity. Even, even most sports kind of have where in the socioeconomic ladder they are a sport. Like tennis doesn't really draw a lot of blue collar people. <laughs> right? Uh, but jujitsu, for some reason, martial arts in general, draw people from every rung of the socioeconomic ladder, which is awesome from the standpoint of getting to know a more and more diverse set of people. Um, but you're absolutely right. What, what people don't realize is that 
I too, I mean, until this day, uh, I'm turning 35 in less than a month. And I look at literally my network of people and so many of them belong, still are part of my martial arts family since I was 18. And this is incredible. And also what that provided me with, like you said, is people perhaps... Some are younger, a lot of them were older than me at the time, and they knew a lot of things. They were in so many industries I wasn't any part of. And the the most significant factor I found for myself is after graduation, 22, 23, you know, all your friends disperse into anywhere else in the States and you feel alone. And I had a solid network of my martial arts friends. We're still all right there in Boston who helped me it introduced me to numerous opportunities, helped me with that difficult transition because I'm also not a U.S. citizen. So, uh, you know, very few opportunities were even uh, available to me. So that was incredible. Just reading your book, that was the one thing I was like, oh my God, you know, you see all the dots connecting. Um, there are so many topics in your book that have been explored on many other podcasts. And there's one thing that really kind of caught my eye um, was seek out silos was something I really struggled uh, with. And I know um, that there's a bit of a dichotomy there uh, as well, because when I used to work at digital agencies, I noticed there were so many silos created, even within the creative area. Like designers didn't necessarily respect copywriters and they, they all struggled, they all fought with the developers. Um, but at the same time, I noticed by belonging to a certain community, I watched my mom as an artist, uh, being part of a group, of many artists and they share the work, they share new techniques, stories. Many of them are a lot less experienced than my mom. And there's that cross-pollination going on and it can be also very helpful. So what are some of the ideas you had in mind while like writing about that and what triggered you to write that? Yeah, well, I mean, I guess the the big thing that triggered to write it was there's a couple different studies demonstrating this. So, so in in practice, in practice language, we use the term silos to talk about the different divisions of a company or the different little clusters. Of, in network science language, they use the term clusters, right? That as people gravitate towards each other, they form sort of a cluster, and a network is really just a series of linkages between uh, clusters. And if you if you think about it from the lens, if you grew up in that sort of corporate space where you know that silo, silos, politics, turf wars are all sort of bad things, it was really surprising to find this body of research that said, no, actually, for, for ideas to spread, you can't have a purely egalitarian network where everybody's connected to everybody. You need clusters. For people to get better, they need some level of community. So for, for everything, there is balance, right? But you, you actually need kind of a community of practice, a group of people that you can have more in-depth conversations with. Sociologist um, Ronald Burt uses the term, and Dory uses this term too, so I know you know it, but bonding capital, right? There's bonding capital and there's bridging capital and you need both. You need a, a small cluster to have that bonding capital to grow, to have the honest conversations about where you need work, to have people giving you honest feedback about how to get better. You need that community. You can't stay in that community and that's where the bridging capital thing comes in because most, most of the genius ideas in, in a world, in a marketplace, in corporations, uh, in life in general usually come from when an idea migrates from one cluster to the next cluster and it's seen as a novel new idea to that cluster. That's how information spreads. It doesn't spread perfectly, smoothly, egalitarianly through this interconnected network where everybody knows everybody. It moves from cluster to cluster and gradually gets adopted by more and more people. And so you need um, to be able to be bridging to other communities to find those new ideas, both to bring them to your cluster, but also to potentially know it's time for you to move to another one. The analogy that I've learned to use to describe this, and unfortunately, I learned it after, uh, or I, I thought of it after I published the book, is that clusters and silos, communities like that, they're sort of like a harbor, right? It, there was a time where the only thing that kept the entire world interconnected was ships and trade routes, right? Right. And there was a harbor. You need the harbor. The harbor is where you restock. The harbor is where you repair, where you find a new crew, where you get better at certain techniques. However, if you stay in the harbor your entire, the entire life of a ship, you're not connecting the world. You eventually need to set sail and get out and go to another, another harbor, another community. So you need both in your life. And like a lot of things, not a, like martial arts in general, balance is that, is that key. You've got to have a balance between being in that silo and not. And I think unfortunately, the majority of especially networking advice right now is just talking about diversity, 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 diversity. And that's important. Definitely is. But you can't just only have this such a diverse collection of people in your life that there is no 
no one that you can have an open, honest conversation in your practice, in your field of study, your field of work about how to get any better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, I, I love when you mentioned that the connection between different clusters as well. Hi there, this is Fei Wu, and you're listening to the Phase World Podcast. Today on the show, welcome David Berkus, who is a best-selling author, and his new book, Friend of a Friend, offers new perspectives and tactics that will work for you today on how to better network and build key connections. One, one thing I think as part of um, your writing, why I love your writing, Stephen's writing, Dory's, uh, is the fact is the balance between sharing examples of other people versus your own reflections, and to to take another step further, uh, is you know science versus opinions. There are a lot of books are based on like almost the author's own opinions, which can be also very interesting, right? Uh, like fictions, it's purely you know, but. A lot of the, I think what I like about yours is that it is backed by science and studies and examples. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I mean, that's the goal. Um, so it's specifically actually inside of networking, there, there are pretty much every book that is out there is a book of advice, right? It's one person or two people's advice on here's how I did it. Um, or the slightly more compelling, I wasn't doing this, and then I did do this, and it changed everything, right? Um, but they're both they're both that sort of personal story, and that's great. But like, I, my background's in social science. That's what we would call a sample size of one. You can't get published for discovering a new amazing phenomenon with a sample size of one. You just can't, right? Come back when you have two hundred and forty nine other people, right? And and compare and, and do the same intervention and compare the people that you did the intervention to the people that didn't, and what are the differences over time? Like you know the placebo control I did. That's that's science, right? And that comes from a collection of different stories. So, you know, those, those individual advice books are great. I mean, the this, this sort of CEO memoir type of book is great for finding really cool stories that illustrate a point, but they're an anecdote. And until that, that anecdote has a couple hundred other people who have the exact same anecdote, you don't really have a trend or anything that you can define. I mean, the problem with most of the advice books is that they might be good advice for you if your background matches that person and your situation matches the situation they faced. And you are, if, if you're very similar to that type of person, then their advice is worthwhile. If you're the polar opposite of that person, then their advice is probably useless to you. And I think it's, again, to go back to networking, this is where I think a lot of people think it's sleazy and inauthentic and weird is they're trying to apply someone else's advice who's very different from them. And then they're experiencing that feeling of feeling not like themselves because they're literally pretending to be someone else by applying that other person's advice. So I'm not, I'm not all that interested in advice books. I, I love the stories and the individuals that sort of highlight it as an example. But the, the worst thing you could do in any of my books or Dory's or Stevens or, or anyone like that is to read one story and then go, yeah, I want to do that. Like for, for friend of a friend, a lot of people talk that one of the stories everybody's resonating with is John Levy and his dinner parties, right? And this whole idea in line with the shared activities principle that he throws dinner parties where you can't drop your name and title and what you do. And you have to actually help cook dinner. You're not there to be entertained. You're there to sort of join a shared activity of cooking this meal together. That The point is the shared activity. The point isn't throw a dinner party where you ban people from sharing their first names, right? So it's, it's less that... That story is a great illustration of the science behind it. But the beauty of, I think, teaching people here's the body of research and the, the scientific phenomenon is that you can then take that and use that in any way that you want as long as it's in line with the science. So for me, I don't throw dinner parties. I'm part of the jiu-jitsu community, which is itself a shared activity that satisfies all of those criteria. Nobody cares who you are and what you do for a job when you're rolling on the mat, right? They don't. So you don't have that. It's, it's the same principle, very different activity. And that I think is better for most people so they can find their version of the thing that's not them pretending to be someone else. It's them doing something that's authentic to them in line with the science and that way they get the benefit. Yeah, I, I love how daring some of the statements are. Like I love how the way that you write about things are not lukewarm. Like people either may agree or may disagree. And I wonder like based, I know you just released the book, but what are some of the comments including kind of critics will, will kind of have been sharing with you? Like, yeah, it's, it's too, it's kind of too soon to, to know what the critics 
are saying. There's only like, I, I, and I actually, what is today? But we're almost at that point where we're outside of a month since launch. So I'll start ignoring the Amazon reviews. But when, when they're coming in like and just dripping in, you do start to pay attention to them. And the only critical review we've gotten so far was a really weird one that basically said, oh, the book is well-researched and the stories are entertaining, etc. But the world shouldn't work like that. It shouldn't just be a matter of who you know, etc. And I think that'll... I, under, I understand that belief. I agree with that belief. It probably shouldn't be like that. But it is. You know, I, I also wish that the way that calorie consumption leads to weight gain didn't work the way that it does, right? It'd be, it'd be so much better if you could eat twice the amount of food and not have the same. You know, but saying it should work that way isn't going to change the fact that, no, this is actually what we know. And so this is how I need to pick my diet, right? Same thing with, um, with networks. It's not, you probably should be that way, but no amount of screaming is going to change it, right? And no amount of interventions are going to change it. And so the only thing to do is realize, all right, it is this way. Um, and truthfully, I don't necessarily think that's bad news. Like, again, there was, a, there was a time when the working title was Who You Know, and the whole idea was that it really is a matter of who you know, not just what you know. What you know is still important, mind you. You can't be an imbecile um, and succeed on who you know. But it still is um, what you know and also who you know. And that's good news because you're in control of both of those things, right? The stories of that person that was just sort of born into this incredible network, et cetera, those are more rare than the stories of people figuring out that, okay, it's a matter of the community that I'm a part of and the network that I'm a part of. So I need to be intentional and take this seriously. Those stories are actually more common and they see that who you know as good news. And I think we all should. So that's been the number one critique um, but it's not really, it's, it's not really a fair critique. I, I agree with them. It shouldn't work that way, but unfortunately it does. And so we can rail against it or we can learn how to use it for our benefit. Absolutely. And, and like Seth Godin said, do not read. I mean, the one and two star reviews mean nothing at all. I mean, nobody has ever learned a thing to say, oh, that works. Yeah, I mean, I know, again, like I said, I normally don't. There's only, uh, currently at the time of this recording, there's only one. And so when it popped up, it was sort of like, oh, all right, well, let's, let's at least see. But eventually you get to the point where they start to come in a lot. And I mean, I haven't actually, I check the number to see how we're doing in terms of getting feedback from people. And that's about the only thing that I'm looking at at this point now, you know, but now we're almost 30 days out from launch when we were a week out, you know, you get, you get curious, but I also, by the way, the same sort of rules apply for the Ted talks and that sort of stuff. I don't, I don't read the comments. It doesn't, nothing productive, nothing productive comes from, from critiques given inside the cloak of anonymity. Right. If you want to go on record and have a face-to-face conversation, tell me who you are and what your critique is. I'll listen to that. I will, it's because if you're willing to sort of put your name to it, then it's a valid sort of criticism. If you're not, then like you know, I'm sorry. I don't. I don't really count that as all that good. This is one of the few things that I love about Brene Brown is that she translates that that great quote from Theodore Roosevelt about it's not the critic who counts, it's not the man, you know, the man in the arena quote. And she goes, translation, if you're not actually doing the work alongside me, I'm not interested in your feedback. And I think that's kind of the key. It's not ignore all criticism, but just know who it's coming from. Yeah, absolutely. I think we all need to learn something about that. Oh my God, you are you're awesome, David. I'm so glad we connected. But thank you so much for your time. I know with young children, your schedule can be quite hectic and you have a lot of engagement. But I, I really appreciate that through a friend of a friend that you agree to be on the show. Oh, no, I'm happy to. I'm absolutely happy to. Thank you so much for, uh, for prepping, for looking into parts of my, uh, my history that I, or, you know, I love that. So um, more to come, David. Thank you so much. I really appreciate yeah. it. No, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Hi there. It's me again. I want to thank you very much for listening to this episode, and I hope you were able to learn a few things. If you enjoy what you heard, it will be hugely helpful if you could subscribe to the Face Royal podcast. It literally takes seconds. If you're on your mobile phone, just search for Face Royal podcast in the podcast app on iPhone or an Android app such as Podcast Addict and click subscribe. All new episodes will be delivered to you automatically. Thanks so much for your support.